We're going to play a game today. You probably never played this game. Name of the game is Are You Now or Have You Ever Been a Member of the Communist Party? Does that sound fun? Well, let me tell you the rules of the game. Uh, the main thing you need to know is that I will win the game. Uh, so if you play the game with me, which I hope you will, uh, you will lose. And so if you're the competitive type who likes to win everything they do, you probably shouldn't play. So let me explain the rules of the game. And we have to start with a little history lesson. We're going to start with the Cold War. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, taking everything literally, I always found that a really weird term. How can you have a Cold War? Which is actually the best kind of war, because it's the war where nobody is shooting bullets. And the Cold War was the war that evolved with the United States and Russia after World War II. Uh, but let's go back even farther. Let's go back to World War II. So during World War II, the United States and Russia are allies when we're fighting the Nazis. And then we win the war, the US, World War II is over, and World War II ends with the dropping of the atomic bomb in August 1945, and the United States becomes the first country in the world to use the atomic bomb, and still to this day, it has the distinction of being the only country in the world to use the atomic bomb, and we used it on Japan. And the atomic bomb is very important to our discussion because the atomic bomb was the underlying fear and distrust that the U.S. and Russia had, which led to the Cold War. So the U.S. drops the atomic bomb in 1945, and for about five years, until around 1950 or so, the United States is the only country in the world to have this weapon. And this is an awesome power. And then Russia develops an atomic weapon and the whole world changes because we have the bomb, Russia has the bomb, Russia doesn't trust us, we don't trust Russia, they think that uh, US is gonna drop the bomb on them, we think that Russia is gonna drop the bomb on us, and this leads to a period of paranoia and distrust, otherwise known as the Cold War. And this is what leads us to our game. So, 1947, two years after the end of World War II, uh, Congress creates a committee known as UAC. UAC is an acronym for House Un-American Activities Committee. House Un-American Activities Committee, 1947. And the purpose of this committee was to identify, locate communists living in the United States because Russia is communist, and we considered communists our enemy during this time period. So this congressional committee was charged with finding, exposing communists living in the United States. And guess where they went looking for communists? The movie industry. That's right. Why the movie industry? Was the movie industry full of communists? No. But movies are a powerful tool of propaganda, and they always have been. So Congress started looking at the movie industry as possible purveyors of communists in their movies. Another reason why the movie industry was targeted is that politicians love publicity, and you get a lot of publicity if you name a famous movie star as a communist. So in 1947, UAC started issuing subpoenas to Hollywood to come and testify in Washington. And the first question that you would be asked if you had to testify is, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And the answer to that question is no. That's the only answer to the question. If you say yes, then you're going to be in trouble. And the second question they're going to ask you is, do you know anybody or have you ever known anybody who's a member of the Communist Party? So the reason you're testifying before this committee is basically you're proving your loyalty. 
You have to prove that you're a loyal American, that you're against communism, and the way you do that is by not being a communist yourself and identifying anybody you know who might be a communist for the committee. So this is what people had to do. They had to go and testify, and if you knew somebody who was a communist, then you had to give the committee uh, their name. But what made it even more complicated is that communism in the 1930s was a legal voting party in this country. You could vote Communist Party for president, just like you could vote Democrat or Republican. Because in the 30s, during the economic depression, our system of capitalism wasn't working too well. So other systems were looking pretty good. So you were allowed to be a registered communist. It was a political philosophy. It didn't mean that you wanted to blow up the world or blow up the government, but it was a political philosophy. But the term communism changed after World War II, and it changed after the atomic bomb came on the scene. So by 1947, your political past was used against you. And if you had beliefs in communism, then that was considered to be unpatriotic to America. How would the committee know if you knew somebody who was a member of the party? Well, uh, the committee had this organization called the FBI keeping track of you and keeping track of who your friends were. So let's say you had registered as a communist in 1938. Now all of a sudden the FBI is going to monitor where you go and who you associate with. And by the time you have to sit down to testify, they're going to know exactly who your friends are. So major Hollywood stars were called to, come to Washington to testify. All of the studio bosses were called to Washington to, st to testify. Walt Disney, he went there and testified. Louis B. Mayer, the head of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, he testified. Jack Warner, the head of Warner Brothers, he testified. They were all asked, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And they had to answer no. And then they were asked, do you know anybody who has ever been a member of the Communist Party? And if you do, or if you ever did, you better name them for the committee. Because the third question you would be asked is, do you know anybody or have you ever known anybody who's a member of the party? That was your opportunity to prove your loyalty to America by naming people who are communists. The term for that was called naming names. Naming names meant that you provided the names of people who you thought were communists. And so there were two types of witnesses who testified before this hearing, and they were called friendly witnesses or unfriendly witnesses. And I love this term. I love that word friendly. Uh, friendly witnesses were witnesses who were cooperative with the committee. They answered the committee questions. They gave the committee the names of people they thought were sympathetic to communists, and that was friendly witnesses. Unfriendly witnesses were those people who took the position that the committee had no right to ask these questions. This was America. We didn't have to answer these questions, and so they refused to answer them, or they argued with the committee, or they tried to lie. And if you were unfriendly, and if you didn't cooperate with the committee, you got in trouble. And the trouble you got in mainly was you were fired. You were fired from your job at the studio. Because this McCarthyism, which is the term that these hearings were known by, it's called McCarthyism, and it took on this name for the senator, the Wisconsin senator, Joseph McCarthy, who led this hunt for communists in America in the late 40s and 50s. And... If you were unfriendly and didn't cooperate with the committee, you were fired from your studio job because the studio bosses took McCarthyism very seriously to the point where they created something called a blacklist. A blacklist meant that you were an unfriendly witness, you were not cooperative with the committee, and we would not let you continue to work for the studio. Because the studio bosses created the blacklist 
because they had studios to protect. They were very concerned that if they didn't get rid of people who were sympathetic or look sympathetic to communism, that they would lose their studio. So they, they were, this was an economic decision. They were afraid of losing their studio. It was also a decision based on their history because several studio bosses, such as the Warner Brothers and Louis B. Mayer, they were immigrants to this country. Uh, Carl Lemley, who founded Universal Studios, was an immigrant from Germany. So they were very afraid that their immigration status would be used against them because some of them were born in Russia or near Russia. And so they were very fearful. So out of fear and out of the desire to protect their studios, they blacklisted anybody who did not cooperate with the committee, known as an unfriendly witness. The first 10 witnesses from the movie industry to testify were known as the Hollywood 10. And this was a group of screenwriters and directors and producers. They were the first witnesses from the movie industry who were subpoenaed and forced to testify. And they all took the position that the committee did not have the right to ask these questions, that this is America, we have constitutional rights, and if we're going to cooperate now, then what's the committee going to ask us next? Our religion? So the Hollywood 10 all decided not to cooperate. They were all unfriendly witnesses. They decided that they would answer the committee questions to an extent, but they would not name anybody. And that was the position that they took. And as a result of this position, all of the Hollywood 10 were blacklisted meaning they all lost their jobs, and they all went to federal prison for contempt of Congress. They were all put in prison. So this had a chilling effect on the rest of the movie industry. The rest of the movie industry saw what happened to these 10 men, and they realized, oh my God, this is serious. If we say the wrong thing, we could go to prison. So uh, this was really upsetting to the rest of the movie industry. So the way these hearings operated is they would have hearings. The UAC committee would have hearings in Washington for a few weeks. Then they would adjourn. And then six months later, they would have more hearings. And then they would adjourn. And this went on for years. And hundreds and hundreds of people from the movie industry were eventually called to testify and had to give testimony uh, before Washington and for this committee. And uh, McCarthyism had a devastating impact on the movie industry, especially during the 1950s. Uh, one of the biggest impact it had is many of the best, most talented writers and directors were blacklisted, meant fired. Uh, they couldn't work. They were uh, not allowed to work. They were fired from their jobs. So the quality of, of movies suffered in the 1950s because of this. Another impact of McCarthyism is during the 50s, the movie industry became very reluctant to make any kind of movie that was political because the last thing they wanted to do was to get into another fight with the government. So those were two big, huge impacts on the movie industry. The most famous member of the Hollywood 10 was a screenwriter named Dalton Trumbo. Dalton Trumbo was an Academy Award winning screenwriter before the blacklist. And later on, after he got out of prison and years later, he came back to work and he won Academy Awards again. Now he was a screenwriter, he wrote movies, which meant that even though the blacklist was going on, he could continue to work. So the way that would work is he would write a movie and then he would have a friend of his submit the movie under their name so that nobody would know he actually wrote it. And then they would split the money for the movie. So this is how screenwriters like Dalton Trumbo considered, uh, continued to work. A movie was made about Dalton Trumbo a few years ago with the actor Brian Cranston from Breaking Bad playing Dalton Trumbo. It was a really good movie and it's worth seeing because it shows the impact uh, that McCarthyism had on Dalton Trumbo's life. So the Hollywood 10 were all blacklisted. They all went to federal prison. 
eventually they all got out of prison and uh, the blacklist finally ended and they all came back to work in the movie industry. There was no official ending of the blacklist. Um, it ended in the early 60s when several courageous filmmakers like Kirk Douglas and Otto Preminger decided that people like Dalton Trumbo were just too talented not to work and they hired them to write their movies and they gave them screen credit for the movies. So uh, the blacklist ended uh, after more than a decade and it ruined lives. Uh, thousands of people were blacklisted. A lot of people committed suicide, marriages broke up. And so it had a devastating personal impact on the movie industry. And the quality of movies suffered during McCarthyism and the blacklist. And McCarthyism was one of the one of the reasons that movies uh, lost money and declined in the 1950s. So the blacklist had an ongoing impact on the movie industry. So to recap, all of the studio bosses testified as friendly witnesses, meaning they cooperated with the studios and they named people who they thought were unfriendly or sympathetic to communists. And if you were an unfriendly witness, then you would be fired. You would be blacklisted by the studios. The Hollywood 10 were all unfriendly witnesses. They were the first 10 from the movie industry to refuse to cooperate and uh, they all paid the price. So McCarthyism uh, and these McCarthy hearings starting in the late 40s going through the 1950s had a big huge impact on the movie industry and uh, you keep hearing this term McCarthyism even today. Okay, thank you.